Welcome, everybody. My name is David Rice. In case we haven't met before, either in person, virtually here through Panky, or someplace on the interwebs, but I'm glad to be hanging out with you tonight on this Thursday. We're going to be talking about direct restorative dentistry. We're going to talk about plan. We're going to talk about prep. We're going to talk about place. We're going to move really quickly. This is my dental team. I have a few teams I'm going to introduce you to really quickly tonight as we get going, but this is my practice team in East Amherst, New York, which for those of you who've never been is essentially Buffalo. We took this picture like on the one of nine sunny, nice summery days, but you can tell all these folks get along and it's important, I think, for all of us to make sure that we recognize this is a team sport. None of us can do great restorative dentistry or great any kind of dentistry, really, on our own. So this group of people is super integral in our practice and, and making it happen. Another team I have is through Ignite DDS. So I know some of you, many of you know me through Ignite. Uh, our entire team are young dentists. They're people coming into the industry. Some are six months out, one year out, some are 10 years out. And then, you know, you've got the old guys like me who are pushing 29 years out of dental school and still loving it. So it's a really good thing. And last but not least, someone you need to meet is my better nine tenths. That's Anastasia. That's our four-legged furry child, Gibbs. He likes to hang out and talk teeth every now and again. But I love this slide because it's the message is so important. You know, it's not so much that we prioritize our schedule and keep so busy with dentistry that we can't do anything. It's 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 really more important just to schedule what matters to us. So we're going to talk about a lot of things tonight. We're going to talk a lot of clinical dentistry, but I want to briefly go through a high view of what really matters in life. And, you know, all of you kind of look at the world and success through a different lens. So for some of you, it's being the greatest clinician in the world. For some of you, it's balance between family and practice. For some, it's traveling or family and friends and some you know some of you are here and you want to you became a dentist to do a good job but you really want to make a great living that's your definition of success so I'm going to coin it our teams all of those teams that you saw a few minutes ago have worked really hard over the last decade to kind of build a process for us that's a, a global success strategy with this in the middle self-determined future so whatever your definition is you know I would encourage you to go for it it's going to be different for all of us here. And it's not up to me to define what success is for you. That's for you to define for yourself. And then to understand that in dentistry today, in order for us to have that self-determined future, we need some controls. So we need financial control. We need systems control and we need clinical control. We're clearly going to focus on clinical control today, but I'm here to tell you a lot of our clinical control, a lot of what we're going to talk about is system driven. So if you have those three controls, you got to figure out how to get them. And it turns out there's three pieces to that. There's people, right? There are teammates. That's why I showed uh, my team and I know you all have yours. And the best teams out there, we don't just have like culture in our practice, we have character in our practice. And then when we have teams with character and you and I have character as dentists, as leaders, and we add great process to it, where we know we have these best practices that help us do all the great things Panky teaches us to do. We had people and process together. And hey, it turns out we get control over our systems. And if we have great process and then we add to it complete care, which is everything that we teach at Panky, not just tooth at a time, not just urgent needs, but when we add those two things together, we get financial control. And last and certainly, but not least, when we have complete care, if that's what we're doing all day, every day, and we have teams of character, we have great people, it turns out we get clinical control. And we're not going to go through these nine, but I want you to be aware that they're out there. But these are nine accelerators because we have to have the habits. We have to have the behaviors. We have to have the things we do all day, every day to give us great people, great process, great production that leads us to our three controls and ultimately brings you and I to that self-determined future, success, whatever it is for you. We're gonna live today really right at the top of your screen and treatment, it's just one piece, a really important piece, but one piece. So I wanna talk tonight about decision trees, how patients present. We're gonna talk about patients' daily decision tree. They look at the world a little bit differently than we look at the world. 
We're going to talk about posteriors. We'll talk anteriors. We're going to tease a little bit injection molding and just so you know what's out there, not really dive into it. And we're going to really start here. Patients, they walk in our door with different problems every day. Now, this is a restorative uh, investment in our time this evening. So we're not going to talk perio or surgical or oral pathology or orthodontics or all the other needs that patients could come in with. We're going to talk just pure restorative dentistry and understand that in that world, people come in with a problem and it usually lands either in the direct space or the indirect space, right? And it's based on a few things. So I'm guessing your practice is a whole lot like mine, and you're trying to figure out whether you're going to go direct or indirect based on these factors, right? Is there decay? How much decay? Where is that decay? Are there fractures? Are they horizontal? Are they vertical? Um, where are they? You know, coronal, mid, uh, two, a little too sub G, and occlusion, obviously something we need to pay attention to and, and, and something we're not going to spend much time on tonight but we have to note it as the human factor, right? So if you look at financial control, systems control, clinical, and then say we have people, we have process, and we have production, well, that people bucket, it's not just important for you and I and our teams, our patients are people. So they bring challenges to us. I'm including this in tonight's talk really for one purpose. You know, as I've gotten decades into dentistry, what I have to admit to myself and what has sort of saved me from, I think, going crazy over the years is great patients get great dentistry in our practice. And you know what? Bad patients in our practice, they get our best effort, right? If we've got a six foot six, 400 pound person with big giant masseters and they can't lay back in the chair and they can't open their mouth and they have to sit up every 30 seconds because heaven forbid they can't swallow their own saliva, well, they're going to get our very best effort. But I think if we're honest with ourselves and we develop communication, verbal skills, we're honest with our patients, we can share some things with them to let them know that we're going to do the best we can given the scenario we're presented with. So I don't want you to forget about the human factor, even though we're really not going to dive into it here tonight. One exception as you and I learn all these great techniques, as we introduce new technology, um, whatever it is we bring to our practice, we have to understand that our patients look at the world a little differently than we do, and they each look at the world differently than each other. So I told you if you got here right at the beginning and not a couple minutes in, that I'm ultimately from Buffalo, New York. We don't do a lot of great things in Buffalo necessarily. Our weather's not so great. We lose Stanley Cups. We lose NFL championships and Super Bowls, but we do food really, really well. And we do that well in lots of arenas, pizza being one. So about 20 years ago, I came up with an analogy. When it comes to case acceptance, when it comes to direct, indirect, and how we present to our patients, I like to look at my patients as connoisseurs of pizza. And some of my patients, when they order pizza, they always order a whole pie. They want complete care. And they not only want complete care, they want to know all about it on day one. And then on the other extreme with my patients, especially people who haven't been to see you or me uh, in 10 years plus, that whole pie is overwhelming to them. If we offer them a whole pie, even though they may need it in the first 15 minutes that we sit down, we're in trouble, aren't we? I mean, what happens to that patient? They don't come back. And the worst part is they, they not only don't come back to me, but they don't choose to go visit you. So we've got to figure out who wants the whole pie and who needs a slice at a time. Now, that's not to say we're going to not present things to them, but we have to learn how to frame our conversation with the patient so they understand, they know that when they come to see you and I, our job is to give them the best advice possible. We're going to draw a line in the sand on ethical dentistry with sound principles, but it's okay for them to say yes to that whole pie. It's okay for them to say yes to part of that pie. And it's okay for them to say, you know what? I'm not even ready for a slice today. That's a really important piece to case acceptance. It's why a lot of patients sprint out the door because they feel overwhelmed. And on the other side, Sometimes we get so used to hearing no in our practices that our patients are very underwhelmed because they actually do want the whole pie at one time and we only give them a slice. 
So we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about direct. And in the posterior segment, we've got a couple options. We can layer our composite or we can bulk fill our composite. And I'm sure you have a go-to method right now. What I hope to share with you is a couple options for you that maybe challenge how you do it today and present an opportunity to do it a different way. And if nothing else, it will confirm that you love to do it the way that you do it. So up to you. But, you know, begin with the end in mind. This is what you and I think of, right? We look at everybody's teeth and no matter how they present, we see the finished product. It's because this is what we do all day, every day. The problem is our patients, they don't see what we see. They don't look at the world the way we look at the world. So although we see beautiful teeth that have um, great aesthetics, sound function, goal of that dentistry lasting multiple decades um, and no post-op sensitivity, our patients may or may not have a different focus as us. So if we were in the same room, we'd talk out loud, but I know right now there's a few hundred of us here and half of you look at the screen and you see a gentleman looking right at you. That's who you instinctively saw. And the other half of you look at the screen and you see somebody's profile. That's who you instinctively saw. So as we deal with that human factor, as we try to work with our patients and determine, are we going direct and indirect? Are we doing a slice at a time, half the pizza, the whole pie? Are we doing layered or bulk fill on a posterior or in the anterior? Are we doing simple layers or lots of layers? Our job is to figure out who our patient sees. That's the kind of dentistry we want to provide. It doesn't make a darn bit of difference who you and I see. It matters who our patient sees. And then our job is to deliver the best pizza in the whole world, no matter how our patient wants it delivered to them. So simple quadrant of dentistry for us to take a look at. We've got a molar, an upper molar that had um, mesial decay. We've got a... Um, a second buy that's got proximal decay. We've got a first buy that's got proximal decay. I'm not going to walk through all that with you. We're going to walk through process, but not all the films. And I want you to ask yourself a couple questions, like how would you treat this case? Pretending that things are pretty ideal with that proximal decay. I want you to think about that for a second. And I want to toss out one concept to you. And this is something, gosh, Lee Brady taught me years ago. So those of you who have been to Panky a number of times, you know Lee very well. But if I look at that molar and I see that existing composite, I want you to ask yourself if you believe coming back two years later, five years later, 20 years later, even if that composite looks great, that when you restore a proximal box and you choose to leave that composite and because it looks great, do you think you can actually bond new composite to old composite? And the answer is no, we can't. Now that's not to say that we can't back up restoration to restoration. But what you and I have to realize that when we do that, even with composite, we have a margin just like we have when we have artificial tooth structure, composite amalgam gold doesn't matter, ceramics to tooth, we still have a margin. Once that composite is fully cured, two years later, five years later, 10 years later, we're not bonding new composite to it. We're just butting it up and creating another margin. So I want you to be aware of that because it may change how you look at retreating older dentistry. Now, some things I want to talk to you about that really matter. When we start looking at how do we guarantee contacts? So let me do this for a second. These are things that I know challenge a lot of dentists. Um, I don't have a strong proximal contact. Uh, my tissue is an issue when I'm placing my directs. I'm maybe nicking adjacent teeth. So how do we prevent all that stuff? Because that's our goal tonight, right? Just talk about tips and tricks to prevent things. And for me, really simple, we wedge. Before we start, why not? And think about, you know, every system out there has multiple sized wedges. We don't have time to go into all the details about wedging. We could talk about that for 25 minutes, but there is appropriate sized wedge for every scenario. Sometimes it's small, sometimes it's large. Sometimes it's extra small. So we need to find the right wedge and we need to get it in there before we start. Because when we do that, great things happen. First, when we pre-wedge, we can guarantee 
that we're going to get a strong proximal contact once we restore these teeth, so long as we're using a reasonable matrix system. But we can guarantee it. But it takes about three to five minutes to actually get teeth to move apart. That's how long it takes the PDL to actually really shift, not just kind of get held out of the way and bounce right back. So think about how long it takes you to prep your average tooth. Think about this quadrant. If you were going to prep bicuspid, bicuspid molar, and you pre-wedged, how long would it take you to get all those three preps on? Probably not a terribly long time, but certainly more than three to five minutes. So at that stage of the game, we know we have displacement of teeth. And once we matrix, we're going to get a strong contact. So it makes sense to pre-wedge to maximize our proximal contact when we finish with our restoration. It makes sense to protect the neighboring teeth, right? I don't want to damage the adjacent tooth if I'm not working on it. You've all seen too much dentistry that needs to be done today because you or I maybe nick the tooth. So if I don't want to nick a tooth, pre-wedging in advance is a great way to prevent it. And last but certainly not least, I can protect the tissue. So if RBCs are a thing, when I matrix and I don't want RBCs to contaminate my field, if I hold the tissue out of the way so I'm not touching it, I've got a whole lot better shot at minimizing the complications when it comes to that restorative side. And just a side note, I'm a plastic fan rather than a wood wedge fan, simply because, as you know, wood makes slivers in hands and woods, when we hit it with a high speed hammers, can make a sliver in the tissue. So let's just dodge it all together and use a plastic wedge. I want you to think about this. How can I minimize premature retreatment? Well, there's some things that happen in our process that, that make that happen, right? The number one reason we fail in adhesive dentistry is insufficient depth of cure. So we're gonna talk about some of those factors, but it starts with our preparation design. You know, for years and years and years, we were minimally prepping these teeny little slot preps. And in theory, it wasn't a bad idea, right? Our goal in doing that was conservation of tooth structure. And I'll raise my hand, I'm a huge, huge fan of conservation of tooth structure until it compromises my long-term result. If I've got to go back and then retreat a tooth in three years, five years, seven years, I don't know. I think maybe taking a little more tooth structure and giving myself better access helps me out. So I want you to think in preparation design from concepts. Prep as minimally as you can, except we have to get beyond old restorations. We have to get beyond decay. And we have to make sure that we can instrument. We've got to be able to get an instrument to the depth of that proximal box when we are placing our composite. Now we're gonna talk about some composites that help us, some qualities of flowables that help us. There's some things we can base with that help us. But the end game is, you know, convenience form, when, when GV Black was around, convenience form was all about you and I opening up our preparation so we could actually get to the depth of it and restore it properly. So these are not my images. These come from Rella Christensen, a great friend. Uh, incredible researcher. She and Gordon have done great things in Utah for you know 50 years, 60 years. Um, but check these out, cross sections of what happens when we try to get too conservative with our preparation. You know, every radiolucent area you see, yellow and red area, red being worse, larger gap. But those are gaps that we leave when we try to be too conservative in our prep design. So think about we've we've gone in. We've done our best job, and yet we put our patient in a position to fail prematurely with our composites purely because we just didn't take another, um, you know, half a millimeter or millimeter of tooth structure away. So make sure you can get your instruments in there. I always throw preps in here because, uh, or burrs, I apologize, because people ask. So composites loves rounded surfaces. So for me, it begs using burrs that are rounded because convenience form for me as a dentist is not having to swap burrs in and out of my high-speed handpiece. You know, once you've been doing this for a while, you've prepped a few hundred of these, you realize you can do about 95% of your prep with one burr if you choose the right burr. So I love 330s. I love 245s. They're a little more aggressive so you can get in there and clean things out more quickly. That's great. That's on the prep side. Instrumentation, it doesn't make a difference to me, you know, whose instruments you use out there. Just make sure the size of the instrument fits. And I'm popping one instrument up in this image that some of you have used. Others of you 
have not. It's called an Optrosculpt, and it's an incredible instrument. I wish I developed it. Uh, Dr. Howard Glazer did, but it's uh, it's great. Nothing sticks to those tips. So if you are doing a great job and nothing sticks to your present instrumentation, keep doing what you're doing. If you're looking for an instrument that doesn't stick to anything at all, that's your instrument. It's excellent. Chemistry. Why we fail prematurely sometimes because you and I change the chemistry. I want you to think about every dental manufacturer on the planet who makes a direct restorative material, and they all share some things in common. They all work very, very hard to build a chemistry in their composite, right? It's a fluid matrix with particles packed in. And then I want you to think about all the data they built to show us how great their materials are. And then I want you to think about what happens when you're worried that your instrument's going to stick, or maybe it does stick. So you decide to dip your instrument in your adhesive. And then think about what adhesive is. It's unfilled resin. So every time you have a layer and you dip and you have a layer and you dip, you're changing the chemistry of your composite. So one, don't dip. Two, if you absolutely must dip, understand that there are composite wetting agents out there that are designed to not change the chemistry. But what I'd really recommend is select the right composite. There are great composites out there that are not sticky and make sure you're using the right instruments that will not stick as well. And then you will never have to dip again and introduce any foreign material into that composite that every manufacturer in dentistry has worked so hard to build for you and I. Tough habit to break, guilty, used to do it too. Just learned one day that it wasn't the best thing for me to do and moved on. Matrices. So now think, right? We pre-wedged, so we've done all the right things to splay teeth, excellent. We've, we've um, minimally prepared our teeth, but opened them enough that we have access. Great. Step two. Step three, we've got to put it back together. So what kind of matrix are you using today? Are you getting the ideal proximal context that you want? Are they in the right position? Are they big and they broad? Or are they two incisal and point contacts? Or are they, when you pass floss through, barely catching that floss and they're really, really light? So Several systems out there are excellent. This just happens to be Garrison. It's what I use. It doesn't make a difference to me uh, or to your success, whether you use, uh, you know, Paladent, Triadent, Garrison. You guys can rattle off 10 brands to you. But in the sectional matrix world, many, many of them do this job very, very well. I'm going to mention only one by name in BioClear um, because it's a totally different system. That's a solid system, but it means we've got to change some things because note the word system. It's not just a matrix band. It is a matrix system. So that is BioClear. You'll notice primarily the differences. The bands are mylar. They're clear. And you'll also notice the difference between this ring and the ring on the previous slide. So if I back up for a second, you know, what do you notice about these rings? It's a single ring versus a double ring. So if you want to really drive teeth apart, if you actually want a system that allows you to restore back to back to back teeth at the same exact time, then BioClear is a system you should consider because these bands and rings, no matter who they're from, are not designed for you and I to restore all three teeth at the same time. They're designed for you and I to restore uh, in this case, our middle tooth, our second buy, and then come back and restore our first molar in the distal of that first buy. That's how most sectional systems allow us to get ideal proximal contacts. If you want to stack them and restore the entire quadrant at the same time, it means you need a new system. It means we have to move to something like BioClear that is double ringed and can really push those teeth apart even more than pre wedging can do for you and I. But Systematically, preparation design, BioClear requires a few things. It requires warmed composite. It requires you and I to flare our preparations. So it's not a traditional proximal box. It starts as a traditional proximal box. And then we've got to open it up 
to the buccal and the lingual in order to gain that flare. So when we warm our composite, we can maximize what this mylar system and double matrix does. So it's a good system, so long as you're willing to change, one, your preparation design, and two, potentially how you deliver your composite today. If you're willing to do both those things, this is an option for you. If it's not something you'd like to do, then don't go buy these bands and rings thinking that you're going to line them all up. It's really not going to be what you think it is. Truths about sectional matrices. So I told you earlier that the number one reason we go sideways in adhesive dentistry is insufficient depth of cure. I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to think about you and I curing composite from the occlusal, which is, let's be honest, where we're doing it from, unless you're somebody who debands and cures from the buccal or the lingual, or if you're using a clear matrix band, you're curing from the occlusal, the buccal, and the lingual. If you're doing those three cures, then you can use anything you want. If you're doing a pure cure from occlusal table down, that way you and I have to start considering if depth of cure is the number one issue, is what's the distance from the occlusal table to the full depth of your proximal box? Because statistically, on most teeth, it's like eight, nine millimeters. And now I want you to think about, are you a millimeter subgingival, two millimeter subgingival? Because now you're talking about 10, 11 millimeters. And now I want you to think about how's your light going to get down that far? Because that's a big distance. And depending on whose light you use, you've got a better shot at getting to that depth than others. And some of the most popular lights on the market, they're not going to go past three, four millimeters in depth, which is the occlusal. They're not getting to the depth of that proximal box. So we can win in this department if we start to think differently. Now, right now, most of you are looking at those bands on the top right and thinking like, oh, those are kind of old school. That was the first generation of band that came out, no matter whose sectional matrix you came out with. They're shiny, they're reflective. And then what happened is you and I complained and said, man, I can't get this band out afterwards. It sticks to the composite once we cure. So manufacturers said, well, let's make that better. And they created what you see in the lower left, those kind of Teflon coated bands. Now those bands aren't bad, but if you just look at the surface of it, it's a matte finish compared to kind of a high glare reflective surface. So if you think about those surfaces and you think about the depth of your proximal box, if your average depth is eight, nine millimeters or 10 plus millimeters on a deep box, and you're worried about your light getting all the way down, understand that that shiny surface is a real big win for you and I, because the light not only goes from the occlusal towards our prep, but it actually reflects off the shine from the metal band, unless we've got the newer bands that are coated. So if you've got a restoration that's kind of run of the mill, go ahead and keep using the bands that you're using right now. But if you've got a very deep restoration and you're unsure if you've got the right light, then try to use a band that's got some reflection to it and you'll get cure on the way down and then you get deflection cure off your band to a greater depth of the composite. Which leads me just from an all-inclusive standpoint to show these clear bands and to tell you if you're curing from the buckle and the lingual in addition, to coming from the um, occlusal, then those clear bands are a win. If you're only curing from the occlusal, then they're not doing anything at all as a benefit to you that the other metal bands aren't already doing. So I'm not saying that they're bad, but don't let somebody sell you that they're great unless you're curing from the buckle and the lingual with your band in place. All right. Margin elevation, hot topic in dentistry today, important topic in dentistry day. It's not, um, it's not a universal fix in all scenarios, but we're talking about direct restorative dentistry. So clearly, for our purposes this evening, uh, margin elevation is a wonderful thing. Now, I've grossly exaggerated what these layers look like, so they're easily visible to you and I, but that blue layer, that's our adhesive of your choice. Then there's going to be a flowable or a glass ionomer, and then on top our layering composite. So the goal with margin elevation is to get that flowable layer or that glass ionomer to lift our margin to a place where that sectional matrix band here, no matter which one you choose, 
can then be placed and we can get a great gingival seal. The problem when you and I try to go right to that sectional matrix band and we've got a really deep proximal prep is that it's really, and you know this, right? You've had the situation. It's really hard to get that seal without then taking the band and pulling it away from the adjacent tooth, right? So you've done it. You've put, you've, you put the band in, you put your ring on, you've got a wedge in there. You're like, great, I've got a seal. But now I'm like 100 yards away from the neighbor and I'm trying to burnish it and stretch it. And then when you burnish it and stretch it, sometimes you look down and you've opened up that seal and it's this nightmare. So understand that margin elevation, it's really simple when you and I just back up one step and we realize that when we're that sub gingival and we're still trying to stay in the direct space, it makes sense for you and I to restore in two steps. Step one, elevate the margin. Step two, get a new band down there and now restore that tooth exactly the way you did before. Now you can do this with a circum, like a Toffelmeyer and a circumferential and then pop that off. Not a big deal. You, there are systems out there that are pure margin elevation bands. Uh, they're usually auto matrix. They're excellent. You can do this with a sectional matrix. Just get that um, margin elevated first and then come back and reband it in order to get your proximal contact where you are. Don't worry about two steps. Your patient doesn't think you're a bad dentist. You're just gonna let them know that you're gonna do this in two steps because they've got a, a, a different scenario and you're trying to keep them from moving to that indirect side of the equation. You're actually helping them. So lose that little, that, that butterfly in your stomach that says somebody's watching me and thinks this isn't going well. It's not going well because of the tooth. It's not got anything to do with your ability to restore it. And for stubborn seals, you've done everything right. You've got it all lined up. You're wedged, you're banded, your matrix, everything's great. Teflon tape is an incredible universal fix in dentistry. So you don't have to take everything apart. Just take a little piece of Teflon tape, roll it like a cigar, tuck it in, and it will seal every time. It's a great way to make your life easy. So we've got this whole thing ready to go, ready to restore. Now we just want it to stick, right? So really quick lesson on adhesives. They all do three things. It doesn't matter whose adhesive you work with. Instinctual inherently to adhesives, especially like universal adhesives, they do three things. They etch, they prime, and they bond. Now, how they do that, the chemistry behind one manufacturer to the second, to the third, to the fourth, that actually matters, right? Because you and I have to get that bond down to the dentin and get it in tubules so we get that really intimate relationship, um, whether you're taking the smear layer away or keeping the smear layer based on your, your etching technique. But what always mystified me was um, what's the answer to how moist should dentin be? How dry is too dry? How wet is too wet? And then I'm going to throw in the human factor for you and I and our assistants. And I'm going to give you my second confession of the evening, which is simply um, as, as great as I try to be, as great as we work on making things day in and day out, I promise that still 29 years later, how I treat the dentin surface on tooth um, 30 at 8 30 in the morning is a little teeny bit different than the one at 10 from one till five till Tuesday till next week, Monday, because I'm human. There is an element of human error. So when it comes to adhesives, yes, they all do the same thing, but no, they're not all the same because you and I need an adhesive that gives us a buffer of forgiveness, meaning it doesn't just perform well on a bench top when everything is perfect, it also performs well if the dentin gets a little too dry, if the dentin is left a little too wet. So these are qualities and adhesives that you and I can look for when we're building this hybrid zone. So really quick, screenshot that you must, you'll have it, um, you'll have the recording to come back and look at it. I don't want to spend too much time, but this is a really sound protocol, no matter whose adhesive you're using. It's tonight's not about uh, which adhesive is the best one in dentistry. It's about uh, process. So this is a really great process. Isolate, gain control of the tissue, 
I want you to selectively etch the enamel. There's no reason in today's world if you're using a universal adhesive to be etching dentin. The data is clear. Now, if you are a total etcher and you've gotten zero sensitivity on everything, you can still do it. It's just not necessary. So we're going to isolate. We're going to control. We're going to selectively etch. We're going to then make sure that our dentin is happy because dentin is this like mystical creature that we have to take extra special care of. So we're going to, we're going to scrub it with a chlorhexidine scrub. That's going to take away any residue um, from our tooth dust as we prepped it and any other schmutz that we left behind. We're going to treat it with 2% glutaraldehyde. Um, I'm not worried today about post-op sensitivity. I'm not doing either one of those steps for post-op sensitivity because I know my adhesive has a built-in desensitizer. But why I love those two steps today, quite simply, is this. No matter how great my bond is today, over time, my bond's going to degrade. That is the nature of the bonding process. It will degrade. And when you and I add that chlorhexidine step, when we add that glutaraldehyde step, we shrink the impact of mother nature breaking down that bond, meaning our bonds will last longer. Not about post-op sensitivity. If you're using the right adhesive, that's already baked in the cake. It's about bond degradation. So if you want to maximize, if you want composite restorations to last 20 years, 25 years plus, it's a great way to do it. All right, qualities. Flowable. I want you to think about things that make sense in the posterior segment. One, radio opaque. Yes, that helps. That helps in hygiene, right? You've got great hygienists, but they don't necessarily see what you and I see. So the radio opacity is a win. Self-leveling on a posterior tooth is a huge win, right? If you think about, we talked about that depth of the proximal box. We talked about making sure we have instruments that get all the way down. Imagine that we've got a flowable composite that self-levels and it seeks the depth of that proximal box. That is a major win for us on posterior teeth. It is a major loss for us on anterior teeth, right? I want a self-level posteriorly. I want my flowable to go everywhere without me having to instrument it. But an anterior tooth, if I'm building it, I don't want it to go anywhere I don't want it because it's a mess. Because I don't want a flowable on the outside of my preparation. I want it sandwiched internally and I want to lay a, a top coat layer on all my restorations, anterior and posterior. Opacity. It's really nice for us to have an opacity shift in the posterior, especially when we're dealing with bulk fill, so we can get sufficient depth of cure. And then as it turns opaque upon cure, we match Denton's opacity, so we get prettier restorations. And this is one I just want you to pay attention to, because every rep in the world is going to come to your practice, and they're going to tell you how wonderful their flow is. And they're going to tell you it's so wonderful because you can go ahead and put it on the occlusal table. You can have it by a cable surface margin. And I'm here to tell you that's not true. It's true for two years or less. At three years or more, we start to see the wear happen. And if you guys are like me, you'd probably like your composites to last more than two years. So understand we've got to embrace and encase our flowables with a layer of composite. So... Many of you are layering. If you do that, you know you can't go beyond two millimeter increments versus a bulk fill. Two uh, Traditionals look like this. Theirs are some of the main players. So Tetric Prime is out there, Omnichroma, TPH, Filtex, Supreme. And if you want to layer, go for it. Just don't bend the rules. Don't think two millimeters means 2.5. Don't think two millimeters means three millimeters. It means two or less. So if you love to layer, go for it. If you don't love to layer, if you want to move to a more monolithic composite to minimize layers to two, and at worst three, because anything beyond that is endodontic for sure, then I want you to consider bulk. And I just want you to remember this is a simple lesson because we all learned about C factor and it's about bondable surfaces um, versus surfaces that aren't bonded to. And I just want you to remember that today's best bulk fills minimize the impact of C-factor. They minimize the problems that C-factor has delivered. Not all bulk fills do that, but the best bulk fills do. So if you aren't going bulk because you're worried about aesthetics, gang, those are three bulk fill restorations. There's a flowable bulk, um, flowable bulk, whew, flowable bulk fill 
um, as a base for the dentin to gain my opacity. And then there's a top coat on top that's enamel to get my translucency. It's two layers. It's easy for you and I to master this. So we talked about this, right? Insufficient depth of cure. That's number one. Sometimes it's our composite. Sometimes it's you and I. Sometimes it's our light. Uh, I don't care whose light you own, so long as your light has certain things that help it to be a great light. First, I need you to make sure you're keying your light to your composite. Different composites have different photo initiators. You've got to make sure that your light cures your composite based on the photo initiator, or just make sure you're using a light that is polywave, meaning it'll cure at peak one and peak two. So it doesn't matter what photo initiator is in your composite. So you can either do your homework or if you wanna guarantee sufficient depth of cure as far as your curing light goes, just make sure you're using the right light. So problem, not posterior, anterior. I'm gonna divide this into layers. We're always gonna layer anterior teeth, we're very, there's the, the only instance where we're not going to uh, layer where we're purely monolithic is, is this in this warmed world or injectable world of composites. Um, and I'm going to touch on that right before we wrap up tonight. But most of the time, we're going to look at anterior teeth, especially if it's one tooth, two teeth. And we're going to try to figure out if it's simple or complex. And when I share simple or complex for me, it's not about how big the break in a tooth is. It's about my patient expectation. So if I have a patient with regular expectations, I'm going to call that simple. And that means that you and I can layer um, with one or two layers, just like we do in the posterior, where we're just having opaque dentin with a more translucent enamel and everything disappears. And if I've got a patient who wants to be on the cover of a magazine, then I know I'm going to need to do a lot of layering with them in order to satisfy what it is they're looking for. So we're not going to go into the human factor, but I'm going to share this one story with you about questions being the answer, about how to figure out who's simple and who's complex, who wants a 10 out of 10 on the cover magazine, and who's happy when you and I deliver an eight and a half out of 10 of aesthetics in the anterior region. And how we get there is asking really good questions. So simple Uber ride for me, I'm in a lot of them as I travel around and speak. And what I learned was this driver who of course was small talking and learning I'm a dentist, starts to share that, hey, I'm doing this whole straightening my smile thing with those aligners. Hmm. In my head, I'm like, okay, he's either going to see you and me or he's doing this thing on his own. Now I could tell him an answer. I could make assumptions. Or I could ask him a question. Like, hey, good for you, man. How's that going? What does your dentist think of the progress? What a leading question. He immediately has to answer back like, wait a second, this should be done with the dentist. So I, in one question, I got to the heart of the matter. Yes, needs to see a dentist. How, you know, how's the health of your mouth? How about the gums? Any cavities? And now that person is thinking, wow, I not only should be going to a dentist, but there's things that could go wrong. What I didn't include in this conversation on this particular image was, would you like to know simple things that could go wrong? Or do you want to know what could really go wrong that can do you harm? Three questions get to the point. So I want you to think about the best questions you can ask every patient to really understand if they want this, which I would consider an eight and a half out of 10, right? To me, that's a simple class four. All I did was match opacity in that restoration. That's very different than a patient who needs complex layering. And I need to do four, five, six layers of composite. But I'm going to tell you in my world, what I love to do, I scan every patient. Every new patient who comes in gets a scan, which means I have a record. So even if you fall off a bicycle, I've got a record and I can use this technique. If you want to talk offline about different techniques, how to restore big class fours, diastemas, anything at all, just reach out to me. But I'm a big fan of creating a putty matrix. I want to know exactly where that incisal edge should be. I want to know exactly where that mesial incisal and distal incisal embrasure should be. Because if I can create the outline of that tooth quickly, simply, effectively, repeatedly, then everything I'm restoring, once I build that outline, is just a class five. And it's really simple to do. So I love putty matrices. I want you to think about simple concepts on anterior teeth. Um, you and I just need to keep our adhesive process off a neighbor. That's all we need to do. I don't care if that neighboring central incisor is a natural tooth. 
It doesn't matter to me if it's an all ceramic restoration. It doesn't matter to me if there's a composite on it. If you and I keep our new adhesive process off that neighboring tooth, then we're not going to bond and create one tooth. So you can use Teflon tape on that neighbor. That's excellent. You can use a mylar strip and then take it out and restore directly to that neighboring tooth. That works great. You can use a sectional matrix like I showed you earlier and just turn it vertically instead of horizontally. You can use BioClear. They also have anterior bands, just like they have posterior bands. But the moral of the story is use anything you want. Keep your etch off the neighbor. Keep your adhesive off the neighbor. And at that point, you can either take that out or if it's Teflon and it's really thin, you can just leave it in. Doesn't make a darn bit of difference. So super fast. Let's pretend it gets more complex, right? We've got to look at things and build a tooth that has a lot of layers. We have to look at bigger factors, right? The technique is the technique. It's the same as the poster, just different kind of composites. So we need to look at people who want that 10 out of 10, and we need to avoid these seven sins. So assumptions, we can't assume somebody wants to be an eight out of half out of 10 when they really want to be a 10. We've got to figure that out. We have to look at tooth position, gingival tissues. We've got to look at arrangement. Do they want us to replicate mother nature? Do they want us to improve mother nature? We have to look at the teeth themselves, dimensions, occlusion, materials, and usage. And so first thing I look at is this, the smiles follow the lower lip. Here's the next question for you. Should it? Just take a guess when this patient notices their lower lips like that. When you and I are finished with the restorative process. So we want to look at these things before and have great conversation. You know these rules, right? Teeth have certain width to length ratios. So if you're storing one tooth versus two teeth in eight and a half out of 10 versus 10 out of 10, somebody comes in for a single central and one is bigger than the other, you better figure out if that patient wants to be a 10, how to balance them out. It means working on more than one tooth, maybe reshaping, maybe additive dentistry, but all these ratios matter. It's just application. I want you to pay attention to tooth angulation and realize that a classic beautiful smile means as we go from central to central to lateral to cuspids, we have a slight mesial cant. We can smoke in mirrors with line angles, change all of these things. We can also change these things with a laser by moving the apices um, of that tissue. We could shift it to the distal if we want to create a little bit more of a mesial cant. I want you to think about the incisal embrasures. Are you going to replicate what's there? Is that what your patient wants? Is that a 10 out of 10 to them? If so, follow what's there. If you're working on multiple teeth, remember that embrasure sizes increase as we move from the center of the mouth posteriorly. So that's important for you and I to realize before we get in there, because it may change our preparation design, may change the number of teeth we work on. It's definitely going to change the matrix we choose and how we contour those teeth afterwards. We talked about smoke and mirrors and changing dimensions of teeth by changing line angles. So think about how you can do that, right? If you want to make a tooth look wider and not work on as many teeth, then push the line angles to the mesial and the distal. If you want to make a tooth look more narrow, so you've got a big composite anteriorly, and we're not going to work on more than one tooth. And we've got to move those line angles more towards the center of the teeth and help our patient not see the things that we know are there. We add all those things together. We can also do that with tissue and move it. I want you to think about texture. And I want you to think about three planes of an anterior tooth on the facial surface. So I put this slide in there to remind you and to remind myself that I've got to change my positioning. Now, I'm, I get comfortable and I work on most people from 10 o'clock. Sometimes I'm at 12 o'clock and I'm always looking down at a tooth. But we've got to remember on anterior teeth, we've got to shift. We've got to get uh, to the side of our patient, like nine o'clock if you're a righty, three o'clock if you're a lefty, and really look at that profile. Did we nail the three planes of occlusion? Did we get the anatomy? If you look at that profile pic on the right of your screen, you can clearly see the mammalon development um, in the restorations we built in. Are they there? Are they not? If you look to the left of your screen, not my image. Uh, if you don't follow style Italiano, you should. Um, but we have to look at texture of teeth, all things we can recreate and composite today. Change your view. Map it out on teeth. Once you've restored them, map it. Draw in where things should be. That's just contour, gang. Two layers. It's a dentin layer. That's an enamel layer. 
two layers of composite. If you get complex, this is your map. This is your guide for shading for teeth when you want to get very complex and do a lot of layering. We can do all the same things that a ceramist does in composite. So I know you're going to get the recording. I'm not going to stick on the slide. I just want you to know that we're capable of building all these layers in. So when I get really complicated, my choice is, is Empress Direct. So I'm just going to show you an Empress Direct case. Not a bad composite. 30 year old, whoever did that did a really great job. Note the contour. This tooth overlaps the neighbor. Note the first assumption or first sin was assumption. And if my patient wants a 10 out of 10 and they want a lot of layers, the first thing I need to ask is, does that overlap that tooth or do I fix that? I'm going to show you what we did. But prep, wide bevels work. We showed that before. Putty matrix, just like I showed before. I have a mylar in here right now just to show you. All I need to do is separate it from the adjacent tooth. Once I have this, I can pull that out and restore this tooth. I need to build from the lingual forward with that putty matrix. I know where my incisal edge is right now. I know where my mesial incisal line angle is right now. I have nothing in my way. I can restore this tooth directly once that initial workup is there. So I'm building in mammalons that you can see. I can add in translucency. I'm sure your composite system does this too. I can map it out just like we talked about. I can polish it. And for this patient, a 10 out of 10, I was like, give me the recreation. Bring it back with that overlap, just like it was before. Just make it look like it belongs. Last thing I want to quickly go through, literally in like a minute, is to understand that injection molding with composite is a thing. And I'm going to show you how to learn a whole lot more about this, as well as everything else we did tonight in hands-on fashion in just a second. But I want you to understand that this is real. This is impactful. You and I can not only restore teeth um, for the short term with this, but we can buy our patient multiple years and work on multiple teeth when we injection mold. Keys, really simply, we have to have a matrix. It needs to be clear. There's a few companies out there that make clear polyvinyl siloxanes. That helps us build the right matrix. We can use warmed composite to, you, to do this technique. There is a flowable on the market today that does a very nice job of that as well. We're gonna come back. Once we have that matrix, we need to make openings in that matrix. So depending on whether you're gonna warm your composite or you're gonna use the flowable that does work, you can poke holes in it. And then what you're gonna see on this tooth sort of in the background is I've got Teflon tape on every other tooth. So I have two clear matrices. The first one helps me build uh, the teeth that are that are presently need to be restored. And then the second one, I come back and I just move the Teflon tape. And then I put my second matrix in and I build the neighboring teeth. And then the only thing I have to consider is that does my patient want an eight and a half out of 10 or do they want a 10 out of 10? If they want an eight and a half out of 10, I'm monolithic. It's all one big piece of composite. And remember C factor, C factor is not a big deal on this type of restoration, right? Because we're totally external to everything we're doing right now. My patient wants a 10 out of 10, then I need to cut back, leave the incisal edge position, leave the um, incisal embrasures alone, and just cut back facially and add to it. I can do that today, right? Today I can do that because my composite isn't fully cured. So I can bond composite to composite. But remember, cannot come back and do that two years from now, 10 years from now, and expect to get a chemical bond to have one monolithic piece of composite when I'm finished years later. I wanted to remind you that this is out there. We blew through a lot of stuff on the treatment side today. It's one of nine pieces that we need to work on if we're going to have production, if we're going to have process, we're going to have people that leads to clinical control systems and financial, and ultimately helps you build what you want. Now, if you want the detailed version of all of this and a whole lot more, including the human factor. We've got an amazing hands-on two-day course uh, in October the 13th and the 14th. We are literally going to dig deep and you will literally do all of these procedures um, all day for two straight days. So this is the course. You're going to get some more information about it. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Yeah, super. Please reach out gang and come and see us in October. I'm like, I'm here to tell you October weather in South Florida is 
pretty darn nice. We're going to have a great couple of days. So I hope to see you there.